Hello, good evening, guys. I am Elon Bowen, online axi.com, resource person for teaching zoology. So, last class we have seen something about uh, the board uh, with reference to the ancient board and the class, you know, that one is happy evening, just press it. And we have seen actually we have the classification, the boards are classified into two types, the modern boards as well as the ancient boards. And one of the examples for ancient boards I represented, that is Archaeopteryx. So it is actually an extinct board, but considered as actually of evolutionary importance, because it is a fossil board having a link between the reptiles and boards. It is only one example showing that the reptilian forms gave rise to the boards, or the boards have been originated or evolved from actually reptile-like ancestors. And what are the reptilian characters that the birds have? So you can see in the picture, the presence of claws, it is a reptilian character. So the four limbs are modified into wings in the case of birds, but normally in all of the birds we don't have any claws in the wings, but in this bird or capterix, we have the claws in the wings. So that is one of the reptilian character. And another one, normally in the case of birds, in all birds we have beaks. The beaks are nothing but modified jaws. The jaws are drawn into beaks. And no birds have normally teeth at present. And it is the only bird having teeth as in the case of reptilian forms. So it is also another reptilian character. So it is another evidence just showing that it is acting as a connecting link between the birds and reptiles. And also we have the long tail, the presence of long tail. It is another reptilian character, for example, the case of lizard or snakes or anything else, we have a long tail made up of many vertebrae. Here also we have a long tail consisting of many vertebrae, you could see in this picture. So these are all some of the reptilian characters. That is why this is considered as actually a connecting link between the birds as well as, that is, the reptilian forms. So this is an example, an ancient bird. So we have no such animals at present, but we have the stuffed specimen of this organism at present in Berlin Museum. We have in Berlin Museum, the stuffed specimen of this Archaeopteryx is available. Evolutionary point of view, it is actually a fossil, extinct fossil bird, a connecting link, a integral form, or actually a transitional form between the reptiles as well as the birds. We'll study more about this one, connecting links in evolution. Now let's proceed towards the next part about the modern birds. So we started so far the ancient birds, the class 1, you know, Archaeopteryx. Now the new Ornithus, the new Ornithus, which includes mainly the living birds, the modern birds. So I'm taking only the living orders, leaving the extinct orders of this class. So it is being divided into three super orders. The first one, Paleonathy, also called as Ratini which includes all the flightless running birds, terrestrial birds, not aquatic forms. So Paleonathy or Ratini includes the flightless running birds. Then Impani, the super horn, which also includes the flightless birds like for example the penguin, but all are aquatic forms. So aquatic flightless birds, which includes aquatic flightless birds and this one includes for example ostriches, American ostriches, African ostriches, we have emu, tinamu, kazoris, kiwis, all are coming under the first category. And this impenna includes mainly the penguins, the aquatic flightless bird. And the modern birds, neon, neonath, neonath, so also called as carinate, which includes the modern flying birds. So these are all the three super orders which are coming under the category, just in the new Ornithus, which includes the modern birds, simply we can see, it just actually in compared with the ancient bird or Capteryx, these are all actually the modern birds. Somehow they are actually modified when compared to the ancient ones. Now just number one super order, that it is. So which includes the flightless birds, which includes the flightless birds. So we have for example, Struthium. It is an example for African ostrich. Rhea, this is an example for American ostrich. So, we have African ostrich, American ostrich, and also other animals like, for example, Struthio, and other diagrams and pictures we'll see later now. So, this is the fastest one, you know that one, the fastest running birds. I mentioned already just the same question you're asking once again. 
Actually, no birds without beaks. In all birds, the jaws are modified or drawn into beaks. No birds without beaks, all are having the beaks only without teeth. Modified jaws are drawn into jaws, sorry, drawn into beaks. So, Struthio, the African ostrich, the largest one, laying largest egg also, the fastest runner also. We have the American ostrich. Then, Cassowaries, the Cassowaries, and the Australian Cassowary. And this is the one again, a largest animal, but not a fast runner as that of the African or American ostriches. Then Dromaeus, Dromaeus, the Australian emu. You know that one it is also the largest one having more flesh, but not a fastest runner like the African or Australian or American, just the birds like ostriches. In Dromaea, this is Tinamo, somewhat smaller in size and Actually, even smaller than this Tinamu, we have the Ajerix, the Kiwi of New Zealand. This is the smallest one when compared to all other birds. And of which the largest one is Truthio, the fastest runner. Okay, now let's see the pictures of each one. Now this is Casuverius or Casuveric. And this is also, you have in Australia, somewhat larger, not a fastest runner. In Romia, the Tinamu. Normally called as Tinamo. See that one having a just like a comb, an elevated comb you have just at the top of the head. Then Romeus, Emo. See that one having more flesh, unable to move fast. It is moving very slowly, not moving fast, unlike actually the ostriches. Now this is Kiwi. New Zealand. So it is found only in New Zealand. Age is found only in New Zealand. That is actually a kiwi. Not found anywhere else. Now the second super order we have impenna, which includes mainly the flightless aquatic bats. For example, Aetinodines. Aetinodines. And that is the best example, the penguins. And we are talking about in terms of evolution also. So for example, they have the wings. Here the wings are called a flipper. So the flipper of this penguin and the flipper of whale and both are actually used for swimming purpose, hence call as analogous organs. The flipper of this penguin and the flipper of whale and both are used for swimming, hence an example for analogous organs. What is the meaning for that one? Organs having similar function but have a different origin. So the flipper of whale has different origin as it is a mammal. And the flipper of this one is having different origin as it is a bird, but functionally both are similar. Functionally both are similar, they are concerned with flight. So that is why the flipper of penguin, you are studying in evolution also when, while going for 12th standard. So the flipper of a penguin and the flipper of whale and both are analogous organs. Organs which have different actually origin but perform same functions. Such organs are called analogous organs in contrast to the homologous organs. Now the next one just we have the super order neonath, neonathy which includes modern flying birds. So it includes a number of actually birds what you are observing every day life. Number one the vulture neophron. Number two just a common crow or splendens. So normally we have three subspecies of this Corvus splendens. An example for geographical isolation. We have actually, just for example, the Indian crow. Then also we have Myanmar crow. And also we have just a Sri Lankan crow. And all these examples are an example for geographical isolation leading to the formation of subspecies. For example, Indian crow, Corvus splendens, splendens. Corvus splendens insolens. And in the case of, for example, Myanmar crow, Corvus splendens insolens. In the case of, for example, that is Sri Lankan crow, it is called Corvus splendens proticatus. So, because of geographical isolation, we have formed different species. The best example for geographical isolation followed by reproductive isolation leading to the formation of subspecies. The best example we can see the Corvus splendens, the crow. As we have three different types of crow formed in different areas in India and Bangladesh. Indian just also, actually there is in Myanmar and also in uh, just in Sri Lanka. Then Pavo Cristatus, the Indian national bird, that is peacock. Then Sitakula, parrot. So it is the only bird which has the ability of moving its lower jaw. You can find it in the case of normal, just a parrot. 
is the only one which can able to move its loeta here and there, setacula. Then you you dina mice. This is normally a quail, Asian quail. So it is best for brood parasitism. The best example for brood parasitism. Brood parasitism. It's the best example for brood parasitism and animal association. That means what is the meaning for that one brood parasitism? It never incubates its eggs. It lays its eggs normally in the chest at the nest of crow. So the eggs are normally being incubated as the eggs are more or less similar to the eggs of crow. The crow doesn't know actually the whether the egg is belonging it or not. So it is incubating and releasing our actually young ones by hatching process. So that is called brood parasitism. So laying its eggs in others' nest and keeping other animal that is other brood for incubation process. It never incubates. It is an example for brood parasitism. The apis, the fastest flying bird, that what we call this one in just a normal language, swift, the fastest one. Then the smallest bird, the hummingbird, you see that one, Archilochus, that is the smallest living bird, just a hummingbird. And our house sparrow, the pass. So these are some of the examples coming into the modern flying birds, coming into the superorder Neonathi of subclass Neonithus. So we have the pictures of all these things you have. For example, this house sparrow and then Archilochus and that is new dynamics, the coin, the normal coin, an example for brood parasitism laying its eggs in crow's nest for incubation. Neophron, vulture. Then Pavo Cristatus, the national bird of India, and Bubo, owl. And you know that one actually it can, it is an example for nocturnal animal. The bird Bubo or owl is an example for nocturnal animal. It can see only during night time. So we have, you know that one, the photoreceptor cells in the eye, that is in the retina photoreceptor cells, namely the rods and cones. So we have in the retina. The rods are meant for actually dim light vision and cones are meant for actually bright light vision and also for color vision. But these animals are nocturnal animals. They could see actually object only during night time. And what is the type of pigment they have? So we have rhodopsin pigment in the rods for seeing an object in dim light. That is after sunset. That is a dog also we can see. And this animal has a short vision only during night time. And for that it has a different type of pigment in the rods. As the rods are concerned with the dim light vision. The name of the pigment found in the rods of these animals, namely the owl, an example for nocturnal, actually just a condition. The name of the pigment is called guanine. Not guanine, guanine. So guanine, that is nothing but a nitrogenous base. You know that one found in nucleic acid. So the name of the pigment found in the eye of all men for seeing an object during night time is nothing but guanine. If you put just E, it is nothing but actually a nitrogenous base found in nucleic acid. So this is the pigment guanine found in the eye of an owl men for seeing an object just to actually visibly during the night time. Now this is a cetacula. I mentioned already the only bone which has the ability just to move its slow edge moving its loyalty in all directions. That is the boat actually set up. So these are some of the examples of modern boats. So we have so far studied actually about the boats, the classification of boats, and about the endoskeleton you have to give more importance because the endoskeleton in the case of boats is greatly modified, having furcula, the wishbone, and also we have simsacrum, the pygostite. Then we have also actually for the attachment of the muscles, the flight muscles, they have keel. So all these structures, you could say, completely ossified. There is no cartilage in the bones of birds. There is no cartilage. Unlike human beings or unlike mammals, in the case of mammals, we have both cartilage as well as the rigid bones. But in the case of these animals, birds, we don't have any cartilage. So the bone is fully ossified. The nature of the vertebrae also, I mentioned about this heterocellus type. Heterocellus type. There is a peculiar condition found only in the case of birds, the type of vertebrae. Now, just let's have another class regarding this mammalia, the last one under the nathostomata, animals with the jaws. 
the class mammalia one group coming at a tetrapod so when did actually the mammals originate i mentioned already the mammals and birds have originated only from the reptiles in two different directions so normally in the evolutionary process if we are going through the different taxa so from fishes to amphibians amphibians to reptiles reptiles to birds and not mammals from birds so we have two by actually two different directions or we can say the bifurcations from the reptilian animals in one direction we have the mammal formation in another direction we have the formation of the birds so they are actually originating from the same stock but in different directions so you cannot say actually the mammals have been originated from the birds it's not so the mammals have originated only from the reptiles just like the birds that is a just a true one also evolution point of view which is a correct also now mammals have evolved only from actually reptiles during the triassic period of mesozoic era i mentioned already this mesozoic era is considered as a golden age of reptiles so in the mesozoic era we have three periods one triassic jurassic triassic and then cretaceous jurassic triassic and cretaceous so the birds make their actual appearance during the jurassic period now we have actually the mammals make their appearance normally during the triassic period of mesozoic era and now the next era we have after this mesozoic era the cenozoic era so during the mesozoic era we have the reptilian forms were more dominant and now during the cenozoic era the mammals were dominant and also the evolution of human beings also taking place during this cenozoic era so we reach the culmination only during the cenozoic era and that is why we have the predominancy of the mammalian kingdom and the this era hence called age of mammals so the mammals originated and flourished now also present at present reaching the culmination during this cenozoic era the last era in the geological time scale hence called as age of mammals then so what are the common characteristics what we have we are also coming under this category so these are all the endothermal animals or homeothermal animals or we can say just the regulators so they are called as a regulators because they have the ability to just maintain their constant body temperature irrespective of the changes happening in the environment so that is why they are considered as a regulators unlike just the reptilian forms the reptilian forms are actually the conformers conformers they cannot change their body temperature they cannot actually have the constant body temperature they can change the body temperature but here we have the ability to regulate our body temperature in respect of the changes in the environmental condition that is why we are considered as a regulators as we are all mammals so endothermal homeothermal animals having a constant body temperature and they are found in a variety of habitats see some of them are found actually in water aquatic forms some of them are arboreal found in trees for example the monkey stars is etc then also just some of them are living a burrowing mode of life what are called the fossorial mode of life and others are just a flight adaptations for example that is called volant adaptation just like a bat so the bats have the ability of flying you know that one so they are found in different habitats variety of habitats either on terrestrial habitat or in water or in some other habitats then what is a peculiar character so they are they are named so because all the mammals are provided with mammary gland to just actually suckle their young ones or to feed the young ones with milk and there is a character a unique character found in the case of all the mammals and now what is the nature of this mammary gland so we have normally in the case of all mammals we have the skin glands what we call as the integumentary glands we have different types of integumentary glands for example sweat glands sebaceous glands etc now the mammary glands are modified sebaceous glands the mammary glands are modified sebaceous glands then coming into the category of midocrine etc so the presence of mammary glands so they are modified sebaceous glands that's a unique characteristic feature of this class then the presence of integumentary glands like sweat glands and sebaceous glands sweat glands and sebaceous glands the sebaceous glands are examples for holocrine glands holocrine we will be studying later under the tissues or histology we will take it later sebaceous glands are examples for holocrine glands 
the sweat glands are examples for apocrine glands actually then the mammary glands are examples for neurocrine glands like that we have different types of glands based on the mode of secretion we'll see later about this one so in all cases we have two passes of limbs these limbs are greatly modified for different adaptations either for walking or for running or for swimming or even for flying purposes or for burrowing see in the case of hedgehog or we have rat or rabbit they have the ability of actually making their burrows so they are leading a burrowing mode of life what is called fossorial mode of life then another important character along with the presence of glands namely the integumentary glands epidermal has presence of epidermal has you have this one only in the case of fox that is mammals no other animals having the has formed by the epidermis so we have different types of appendages what we have for example the nails or claws or even we have the plates on the surface of the body and all are being formed only from the epidermis of the skin that's why they call as epidermal derivatives now there is one character regarding actually the neck vertebra so if you are taking the vertebral column it is being divided into cervical region thoracic region lumbar region sacral region and also coccygeal region these are all the five different regions of vertebral column you are taking either human beings or any other mammal even the case of animals having for example the tail it is being extended we have no tail that's why it is being reduced as coccyx forms you know that one so we have cervical region thoracic region lumbar region then sacral as well as coccygeal region these are all the different regions of vertebral column in all cases we have a definite number of neck vertebrae though other regions have different number regarding the vertebrae in different animals regarding this one what we call this one the cervical vertebrae number is almost constant whether it is a human being or a horse or even the giraffe or even the whale in all cases the number is always constant though the giraffe is actually the giraffe's neck is very long but the size of the vertebra is larger and also having definite number what is called the seven in all mammals we have seven there are some exceptions we will see now so generally speaking in all actually mammals we have the number of neck vertebrae the cervical vertebrae is constant either it is a whale the huge animal or the giraffe the longest one or the highest animal so in all cases we have but in the case of a three toed sloth it is an insectivore a sloth an insectivore so in the case of three toed sloth instead of this seven we have nine vertebrae in the neck region the number of vertebrae nine survive and again in the case of two toed sloth having only two toes and also in the case of manatee is nothing but a sea cow is commonly known as sea cow the manatee so two toed sloth and manatee they have only six so generally speaking we have seven neck vertebrae or cervical vertebrae exceptions are there in the case of two toed sloth and also in the case of manatee we have six and in the case of three toed sloth we have nine vertebrae in the neck region don't forget the total number of vertebrae in the case of whale that is a question came in the question paper so because the number is not increasing though the animal has been increased in its length the same number of vertebrae what we have in our neck region formed in the case of whale or in the case of giraffe no change another peculiar character you have the presence of ear loop the external ear loop made up of elastic cartilage is found in all mammals here also there are exceptions the first formed mammals the prototherians or the egg-laying mammals what we call this one the monotremes or the group monotremata for example this platypus or tachyglossus like for example just the ant eater so in these cases we have no ear lobe you cannot see ear lobe in the case of monotremata group that is spiny ant eater and also duck bill duck bill platypus namely the platypus one in these two animals we don't have ear lobes and also one order by name cetacea this is one order under the class mammalia which includes the dolphins and even the blue whale they also do not have the ear lobe and again another order sirenia this is another order which includes the dugong otherwise called the sea cow so in the case of sea cow or in the case of dolphins or in the case of whales 
or in the case of the monotremes, the inkling mammals, we don't have the ear lobes, the absence of ear lobes, just as one of the important characteristics in the case of these groups, though it is considered as the main character in the case of all mammals. So, ear lobes are present only in the case of mammals, but here also there are exceptions where you have no ear lobes. The Cetacea, the order, and then Sirenia, the order, and also the Monotremata, the first formed actually the mammalian forms, prototheriums, are also called as egg laying mammals. Then, how about the nature of the skull? I mentioned about actually the nature of the skull, how many condyles being present in different groups. So, we have so far studied the fishes, the amphibians, the reptilian forms. Also, we have the eggs as well as the mammalian forms. In the case of amphibians and mammalian forms, the skull is bicondyle. In the case of frogs, as well as human beings or any other mammal, the skull is bicondyle, having two condyles at the base of the skull bone. For example, in the case of occipital bone, they have only two projections called as a condyles for articulation. So, in the case of fishes, then reptilian bone and all. So in the case of birds or eggs, we have only one condyle. So they are all examples for monocondylic animals. So fishes, reptiles and birds, they have only one condyle in the, in the skull region. Whereas in the case of amphibians like frogs and also mammals like human beings, mm -hmm. we have dicondylic condition. Then what is the nature of the vertebrae? So in the case of birds, I mentioned it is a heterocellus one. Or in the case of reptilian forms, we have the amphicellus or just a procellus like that. Now, in the case of human beings or in the case of all mammals, it is acellus. The meaning for that one, if you are taking the syndrome, suppose it is a syndrome, the one quadrant drawing, and other structures, we know that one, the spinous process, transverse process, etc. And if you are taking this, what is called the vertebrae, it is acellus. There is no concavity on either side. It is normally more or less just a flat. Such a type of syndrome or such a type of vertebra with the syndrome is called ACLS without any concavity. It is also called aphiplatian as it is flat on both the sides. So it is not convex, we can say it is flat. There is no concavity, hence called ACLS or aphiplatian. Now dentition. So the mode of arrangement of teeth in just mammals is called what is known as dentition. And what is the nature of the teeth? So, in the case of all mammals, we are describing the teeth under three conditions. One, heterodon. Suppose you are taking human being, we have four types of teeth. If you are taking shark, the teeth condition is called homodon, homodon condition. All the teeth are similar in size and shape. But in our case, we have four different types of teeth, for example, incisors, the canines, premolars, and molars. But in the case of short, we have all the teeth more or less similar. And such a condition is called homodon. Then diphyodon or diphyodon. So here we have two sets of teeth development during the life of an organism. So the early just conditions, we have the milk teeth. And later it is being replaced by permanent teeth. For example, if you have the permanent teeth, 32 in our case, then milk teeth only 20 during the infancy period. So, during development, two sets of teeth formation occurs and that phenomenon is called that type of dentition is called diphyodon or diphyodon. Now, tecodon, teco means cavity. Now, here the teeth are placed in bony sockets, as in the case of human being or in the case of, for example, even the crocodiles also, we have the teeth are being placed in bony sockets and that condition is called tecodon. But when you are taking human beings, we have one more type. So we are having heterodon, diphyodon and then tecodon condition. Also the human teeth are described as eunodon. Eunodon. This is another one regarding the human being. So what do you mean by eunodon? Suppose you are taking any teeth. Say an example of this molar or premolar teeth. We have the grinding surfaces. So on the surface of the teeth, we have shallow cavities. Some shallow cavities or shallow grooves. And they are called as cusp. They are called as cusps. So in human beings, the cusps are very shallow. Regarding, for example, this premolars and molars. And such a type of teeth, 
together call as pure neutron having locus having locus this connection is formed that is pure neutron so human teeth are described as heterodon diffodon and the theodon along with unodon as it is having locus on the surface on the grinding surface then then about the salivary glands generally speaking there are four pairs of salivary glands in all the mammals there are exceptions they are named they are named so the parotid the largest salivary gland it is studying more in physiology digestion then submaxillary also called submandibular then sublingual just below the tongue and the fourth one is called infraorbitals present just below the orbit of the eye below the orbit of the eye and that is a salivary gland absent in man named the salivary gland absent in man just about the infraorbitals we have only three pairs of salivary glands but if we are taking just rabbit there are four pairs of salivary glands so in rabbit we have four pairs of salivary glands but we have only three pairs of salivary glands this is another question the type of salivary gland absent in human beings nothing but the infra or pictures so we have only three parts but rabbit has four parts of salivary glands then regarding the respiration as a general rule we are all terrestrial animal those some animals are living in water so an example of aquatic whales or the dolphins or the sea cows so all are living in water though they are living in water they have mainly the lungs as the respiratory organ they are coming to the surface of water for just taking enough oxygen rich air and also for giving out carbon dioxide rich air so they are all the lung breathers irrespective of the environmental conditions whether they are living in water or on land they have only the lungs as the respiratory organs there is no just actually another option then the respiratory aperture just enter the opening through which air enters into the lungs suppose you are taking the respiratory system you studied i think so this is what we have the trachea then the bronchi the branches we have the lungs this is what we have so here this is a opening that is a slit and this opening is called glottis this opening is called glottis so the glottis is the respiratory opening of the trachea through which air enters into that is the lungs now while taking the food there is a chance of getting entry of food into this trachea through this glottis that is to be prevented so in all the mammals this glottis can be protected by means of a plate a cartilaginous plate what is called epiglottis so in the case of human beings or in the case of mammal there is a cartilaginous plate a lid Use for opening and closing the glottis, a respiratory aperture or a slit formed in the just the beginning of the trachea, that is in the larynx region. Now this epiglottis is made up of a special type of cartilage, what is called elastic cartilage. Just like ear lobe, our ear lobe is also made up of elastic cartilage. This epiglottis is also made up of elastic cartilage. We'll be getting more about this one and other tissues. So epiglottis is found in the case of all mammals. Just here and there, there are some exceptions, but in most cases, 99% of the mammals have this opening. Then another important character: the presence of diaphragm, the presence of mammary glands, the presence of hairs, and also the presence of diaphragm. These are the three important characteristics of man. So an animal is called so only when the animal has, for example, the diaphragm, the muscular partition between the thoracic cavity and the abdominal cavity. So a muscular partition, the diaphragm separates the thorax from abdomen. So actually, it is being supplied with the phrenic nerve. We have the breathing ability. The muscles of the diaphragm also taking part in breathing. Suppose a person dies, meeting an accident. He dies without any injury. There is this is one person came in the question paper regarding human beings. So a person is meeting an accident. He dies without any external injuries. There is no bleeding. Then what will be the cause of the death of the person? This is a question. So there are no external injuries. There are no actually there is no bleeding from the body. The person is alright, but he dies as soon as he met an accident. The reason for that one because of the just actually torn of the diaphragm. The diaphragm becomes actually torn, so leading to the loss of the breathing ability of the person, and that is one of the reasons why the person dies because of actually the tearing of the diaphragm. is being torn 
because of meeting an accident, because of the impact of force or shock. So there is an answer for that one. If there are no injuries external side, if there is no bleeding, if the person dies, it may be because of the tearing of the diaphragm. The diaphragm become, actually becomes strong and that results in the death of the individual. Now, about another important characteristic feature, about the orbeasts. In all the mammals, the orbeasts are uniquely. Even other organelles also absent in the case of RBCs. We don't have other organelles, even the mitochondria, the colloid complex, and also that is the nucleus, all big absent. So the nature of the RBCs, normally they are enucleate. There is no nucleus at all, except in two animals, which are closely related to one another. We'll see the picture later. One is the camel, the camelness, another one the llamas. So in the case of camel and llamas, and both are closely related to one another, they have orbeces which are nucleated. And again in the case of other mammals, it is biconcave. There is a concavity. We'll be studying later about another tissue. So I'll show the pictures about the concavity, a beautiful picture of this orbeces. But here, normally, it is biconcave without nucleus. But in the case of camels and llama, there is a nucleus and also the cell is oval or elliptical and like. So we have discus shaped on basis in the case of human beings or any other mammals. But in the case of these two mammals, llamas and camels, we have our basis are nucleated and oval in shape or elliptical. This is a peculiar condition. There is also another and that is positive. Remember these two animals. Then heart is four chambered, as in the case of birds but with only left aortic arch. So what is the difference between actually the heart of uh, birds and the heart of mammals? And the main difference, suppose you are taking the mammalian heart, so the heart is four chambered in both the cases, and we have the aorta that is arising from what is called the left ventricle. It forms an arch like this. And this is what is called the left aortic arch. This is seen in the case of human beings or in the case of any other mammals. But in the case of birds, instead of this one, we have the aortic arch only towards uh, just what is called the right side. So in the case of birds, we have the right aortic arch. In the case of uh, mammals, we have the left aortic arch. There is a major difference. And all other just the structures are more or less same, but with a little more complexity in the case of human heart and both are myogenic heart only because they have the ability to generate the heartbeat. Then the renal portal system, this is the person who came just year before last year also. So when you have the renal portal system, normally a portal system is the one responsible for the transport of blood from one organ to another organ, not directly to the heart. A portal vein, you know that one. A portal system is the one which consists of a portal vein that transports the blood from an organ to another organ and from where only the blood is transported to the heart. There is no direct transport of blood from one organ to the heart. Blood from one organ is being drained and carried towards another organ from where only the blood is transported to the heart. Such a system is called a portal system. So it is well developed normally in the case of vertebrates. That too in the case of amphibians, we have both renal as well as hepatic portal systems. Even in the case of fishes also we could see that is the renal portal as well as hepatic portal systems. But in the case of birds, it is somewhat vestigial. In the case of reptiles, it is somewhat present. But in the case of mammals, the renal portal system is completely absent. They have only the hepatic portal system. So out of the two portal systems, in the case of mammals, only one portal system is found, namely the hepatic portal system, and there is no renal portal system. It is found only in the case of fishes and amphibians, that is poorly developed in the case of reptiles, and then vestigial in the case of birds, and completely absent in the case of mammals. Then, about the brain development. You know that one, one of the evolutionary process that is happening during the evolution of man, increase in size of the brain. From 800 cc to just 1500 cc, the size of the brain has been increasing. One of the familiar events happening during the evolution of man is nothing but the development of brain. Increase in size of the brain. That's also another important question regarding the evolution of man. 
in relation to the brain structure. Now we have two equal halves in the cerebrum, that is in the forebrain, named in the cerebral hemispheres. The two cerebral hemispheres are actually joined with one another because of a, a nerve sheet, and that is what is called the corpus callosum. In the case of mammalian brain only, you could see this corpus callosum and no corpus callosum anywhere else in the animal kingdom. So, a peculiar character also, the two cerebral hemispheres of the forebrain are simply joined by means of a nerve sheet, what is called corpus callosum. You know that one we have the right and left brain concept. The two brain are, we can say that is the left cerebral hemisphere and the right cerebral hemisphere are concerned with doing some activities. There is a division of labor among themselves and these two are coordinated because of uh, the joint between the two cerebral hemispheres, what is called corpus callosum. If the corpus callosum is damaged, there is no coordination of the two sides of the brain, namely the right and left. That is form the main function of the corpus callosum. Then another one in the brain regarding that one optic lobes. Normally, if you are taking, for example, the animals starting from that is the fishes, frogs, reptiles, and also birds, the midbrain is formed up only just to two optic lobes. The number is only two. But in the case of mammals only, there are four optic lobes. Hence, together call as corpora corti gemina, a structure formed by four optic lobes found in the midbrain region concerned with visual activities and also auditory activities, reflex activities. We'll see later. So, optic lobes are four in number, unlike the birds or just the reptiles or the frogs or the fishes. Then, about the cranial nerves, there is no change starting from reptiles up to. Up to mammalian forms, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves. In our case, we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 31 pairs of spinal nerves. So, this is constant starting from reptiles, birds, and mammals. But in the case of reptiles, in one group I mentioned earlier, you know that one, recall that one. In the case of snakes, they have only 10 pairs. All other reptilian forms have 12 pairs, except in the snakes, they have. 10 pairs of cranial nerves just like the frog. Then, the eyes are provided the peculiar glands, the modified glands. So, in our eye also we have certain glands. The glands are the tear glands, lacrima. Another one just the meibomian glands. Another one the hardarian glands. So, lacrimal glands otherwise called, you know that one, the tear glands. The meibomian glands secrete an oily secretion, meibom. The name of the secretion is called meibom. And this meibom actually keeps a thin film of water formed on the surface of the eye, secreted by the tear glands, lacrimal glands, without being dried away. Without being dried away. Without being dried away. So, the lacrimal glands are concerned with now, just the eyes are provided with the three types of glands, lacrimal, meibomian, and hardarian glands. The lacrimal glands are otherwise called the tear glands, which are always keeping the eye mice. The meibomian glands normally somehow present along the inner corner or inner margins of the eyelid. These are all the glands present on the inner margins of the eyelid. Some are modified sebaceous glands. Even you have developed what is called the stipe, the swirling on the eyelid margin. This is because of the inflammation of the meibomian gland. So, it secretes an oily secretion, what is called meibum. That meibum keeps the tear film, which is not being dried away. That's why the skin is always kept moist. Now, this hardarian glands also form in the eye region. They also secrete some fluid, and that fluid is also responsible for keeping the eye. So, eyes, Mice along with just uh, the eyelashes also keeping actually it's being the eyelashes also being kept uh, just shiny. This is because of the secretion of the meibomian gland. So anyway, the lacrimal meibomian and ordinary glands are found in the eyes of mammals. They are concerned with the keeping the eye always moist. That is a main important one. Now the kidneys are metanephrine. So in the case of reptiles, birds, and mammals, in all cases we have the kidneys are metanephrine formed only at the post end of the body. Now, what about the testes in the case of males? So, if you are taking the males, we have the testes are being placed in uh, 
scrotal sacs in the scrotum just outside the body it is being descended it is being descended and placed in the scrotal sacs because so the sperm development the formation of the sperm needs a little bit less temperature than that of the body around about 32 degrees celsius that is why normally the testes are being descended and placed in the scrotum but in some cases in human being also there is actually what will happen there is no descendants of um, that is a scrotum uh, sorry the testes into the scrotum and that condition is called crypt orchidism that means the testes normally found in the abdomen at the time of birth it is being descended and being placed in the scrotum and that what is happening so normally there is no descendants of the testes into the scrotum and that condition is called crypt orchidism that is what we have in our case now the testes remain in scrotal sacs except in some animals see that one in elephants you couldn't see then whales and some insectivores like sloth so the insectivores for example we have the just the animals like shrew mole and also that is uh, just manatee just these are all the animals and they have the scrotal sacs not being placed outside the body they are present inside normally there are no scrotal sacs the testes are being placed only in the abdomen there is no formation of a scrotal sacs in the case of elephants whales and some insectivores in the case of it or, or moles or shrew as a general rule in the case of all mammals we have fertilization is internal because the mammals are giving but egg ones they are all baby parasite animals excepting the egg laying mammals you will see the prototheriums the monotremes they are considered as egg lays because they lay eggs not releasing or not giving birth to egg ones so general rule either it is oviparous or viviparous we have the fertilization is internal so i mentioned earlier except all the egg laying monotremes we have the mammals are viviparous and there is one peculiar structure developed and makes a contact between the uterine wall of the mother and the developing fetus a functional unit between the fetus and the, the embryo so fetus and the uterine wall of the mother what we call this one the placenta a vascular connection between the developing fetus and the uterine wall of the mother for providing nourishment and also the transport of other materials into and out and that is called a placenta and what is the nature of placenta so during embryonic development actually mammal is an example for amniote so reptiles birds and mammals are amniotes because they have the membranes the extra embryonic membranes like amnion chorion allantois and toxin now in the case of true mammals or the placental mammals we have no yolk sac we have other membranes are formed say an example of amnion chorion allantois there is no yolk sac and so in the case of placenta of placentalia or in the case of true mammals the higher mammals the placenta is called allantoic placenta because it is the one the allantois along with amnion chorion taking part in the formation of placenta but in the case of egg laying mammals like monotremes and also in the case of marsupials so in the case of monotremes there is no placenta because it lays eggs but in the case of marsupials development is taking place inside the womb of the mother up to just 75 to 80 percent at that time the young one is being released by birth and then afterwards it is reaching the pouch what we call this one the marsupial where further development is taking place so so no placenta in the case of monotremes egg laying mammals we have placenta in the case of marsupials but the type of placenta found in the case of marsupials is called yolk sac placenta because it is a yolk sac that takes part in the formation of placenta where in the case of placental mammals like human beings we have the placenta developed from the allantois membrane that means allantois is also taking part in the formation of placenta but here the mouse feels it is a yolk sac which is forming a major part of the placenta that is called yolk sac placenta now what is a classification so we have three sub classes of this class mammalia one the proto prototheria the first form of the mammals or you have that is monotremata then we have metatheria or marsupialia so subclass prototheria we can have different types of classification generally speaking three subclasses prototheria metatheria and eutheria so these are all the two mammals based on angular structural organization highly evolved mammals so the prototherian the group or the subclass prototheria includes one order 
what is called just the monotary nature and the second one meta theory includes one order what is called mass area but you theory is simply called as placenta area that's why i say we can have the classification like this or simply it includes subclass prototheria or monotry meta meta theria or mass area you theory are placenta area because these animals have to placenta and let's have something about the monotremes so why is it called as monotrem the word monotrem refers to actually only one single aperture no no single aperture that is called cleocha there are no separate openings for the elimination of waste the excretive products and reproductive materials there is only one common aperture namely cleocha hence the name monotrem eta but normally in the case of mammals we have separate unary apertures separate reproductive apertures that means you know that one both together in the case of male but separate in the case of females and also we have separate aperture for eliminating the waste but in the case of monotremes all in one just we have only one passage one just opening for the elimination of all the three now the monotremes are mainly confined to three places you know that one australia tanzania and new guinea they are most developed in the case of these areas australia normally we have more number of these monotremes and also in tanzania and new guinea and marsupials most abundant in uh, say an example of australia that is why it's called as a land of marsupials and both actually the monotremes and marsupials are found abundant in australia when compared to other countries that is why it is called as a land of archaic mammals the first form of mammals what we have just the monotremes as well as just the marsupials more in number that is why it's called as a land of archaic mammals now number one prototheria these are all egg laying mammals distinct cleocha is present hence the name just monotremes i mentioned already single opening so two examples normally the living representatives we have one platypus duck bill platypus because it is having a bill looking like a duck that's the name is given duck billed platypus and ornithorhynchus looking like a bird ornithology the study of birds so ornithorhynchus this is an example and tachyglossus echidna this is spiny anteater so most are abundant just now in australia that is spiny anteater and also the other platypus birds both are abundant so they are called mammals because they have the diaphragm they have the hands so they have the mammalian characters though they do not have actually just namely the pouch the uterus and they, though they are not giving rise to what is called giving but the young ones they though they are not expecting what is called viviparity they have some common characters as seen in the case of other mammals now subclass metatheria marsupial because they have a pouch what is called marsupial so the young ones are not attaining complete development before attaining complete development they are actually given birth and they are moving towards this pouch what is there on the ventral side of the abdominal region that is called the marsupial the pouch the marsupial that is where the name is given marsupial yeah. now what is a peculiar condition in the case of this animals with the broad pouch see the vagina and uterus are double that is called didelphic condition didelphic condition didelphus you hear the word i think so in the case of class presence of two bundles of anthers didelphus condition the same one here didelphic condition nothing but the presence of two uterus or two vagina and as they are found most in australia what i mentioned earlier so australia is normally called as land of marsupials almost all the marsupials except the american opossum all the marsupials are found mainly in australia american opossum is found only in america now this is a opossum found in america just in south america and all of us are found only in australia didelphix opossum and then macrobus kangaroo having a broad pouch you know that one on its ventral side in both the cases we have the broad pouch the next one australian teddy bear australian teddy bear so it is actually paspolar cross the paspolar cross actually it is australian teddy bear it is normally called koala it is normally called as koala australian teddy bear but coming into the category of marsupial as it has marsupium so uh, that's why i mentioned already this uh, country there is a continent australia is normally called as a land of archaic mammals because being a land for being a native land a motherland for the prototherians and most marsupials 
This land is considered as the land of archaic mammals or simply called as land of marsupials as we have more number of marsupials here. <coughs> now subclass Eutheria. So these are all the higher we parents placental mammals that is why they are together called as placental mammals. So there is one peculiar condition observed in the case of bats and bees. They exhibit one phenomenon what is called echolocation. So in the case of birds the eyes are very poor. Even in the case of birds, they are also searching their actually young ones. It is being recorded also, the young ones are releasing what we have that is ultrasound. So they produce ultrasonic sound. So the birds are normally the birds are normally just, uh, just finding their location by releasing the ultrasound waves and they are striking against the obstacle or obstruction and returning back to the animal so that it can locate where is the actual obstruction that is called echolocation. So releasing the ultrasound waves and just reabsorbing the echo that is coming back after striking against any obstruction and thereby they can find out where they are, where is the obstruction, where is the obstacle. So it is being also done by the waves. They, so it has a number of orders, nearly about 16 orders. I am taking only a few orders of examination point of view. Now some important orders. Number one you see insectivora because these are all the animals feeding mainly on insect. So an example shrew, mole and hedgehog. Then chiraptida, the most important one, adapted for flying, the macropus, the bat. Normally called as a flying fox, macropus larger in size, not a small bat, a larger in size, hence called flying fox. Then the order rotentia, which includes only the gnawing animals, the scrapus, and for example the rat, bandicoot and porcupine, all are coming under this category. And then perisodactyla, you have the horse equus. Equus just actually cabalus, that is the scientific name of horse. We are giving more importance for horse in evolutionary process because the evolution of horse and man taking place together. So there are also evidences of uh, there is uh, evolutionary changes happening in the horse. That is why in evolution, the animal we are giving more importance is nothing but the horse after man. Then lagum marfa, so we have the rabbit correctolagus cuniculus, correctolagus cuniculus. Then proboscide, the animal having a long proboscis, the trunk, named the elephant, elephus maximus. Then cetacea, which includes aquatic animals like delphinus, the dolphins, and also balinoptera, namely the blue wheel, the largest animal in the animal kingdom. So the blue whale, though it is larger, it is feeding mainly on planktons only, not even just a larger, just plants. It is feeding mainly on the planktons only. At the time, it is taking large amount of water along with the planktons. For straining, for filtering the planktons, they have just normally one peculiar structure, a device, and that one is made of whale bone or baleen. That is why the, the this blue whale is called as baleen whale. The name of the bony structure found here for filtering or straining the planktons, what is called the whale bone at Berlin, to filter the small plankton. The plankton that is being fed by whale is called krill. It feeds mainly on krill, the small planktons. Now, Sirenia, example Halico, the Rome, the sea cow. Then Carnivora, we know that one we have Panthera leo, Panthera tigris, and also Felis leo. So, Felis domesticus, Felis domesticus, the cat, the primates, what we belong to, that is man, macaca, the monkeys, the tortoises, and also the lemurs. And uh, Arteodactyla, that is a camel, the camelus, camelus domesticus, and that one, Arteodactyla, that is camelus. So, these are all some of the orders. We have so many orders, but I am taking only a few orders related to the examination point of view. Just go through these examples. And here at this we have the various pictures showing that is what we have the largest animal, the blue whale. Then the halico, the dugong, normally known as a sea cow. This is normally called as a sea cow. Then we have the tarsier and lemurs. Tarsier and lemurs all belong to the primates. We have the tyrobus, the flying fox. Just having, you see that one long wing, the patagium able to just to move for a long distance. Even sometimes carnivores instead of eating fruit. So this is actually what I mentioned already. The camel and llama both are closely related. In these two animals only we have the RBCs are nucleate. And also oval in shape or elliptical. So that's all about what we have about the classification, the biodiversity regarding the invertebrata and the chordata. 
So we have concluded about the coordinator and also the invertebrator. So if you have any questions, you are welcome to ask the questions, we will answer it. And we would like to take the next part, physiology. Though physiology has been given in Samajir Kalvi in 12th standard, but as per the NCRT syllabus, we have physiology mainly in now, that is 11th standard. So let us start physiology from next class. Okay, thank you. Class is complete.